Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Today we have um, Callum, <laughs> who you all know, of course. Callum did his undergraduate here at the University of Hertfordshire, and he went over to the University of Sussex for his master's, and decided to come back again. So he's handed in his PhD, he's finishing up, and this is the big celebratory talk. Um, as we all know, Callum is an international leading expert in <laughs> cataclysmic variables, <laughs> yeah, eruptive YSOs, um, and funny jokes at lunch. <laughs> so without further ado, he would like to talk to us today about investigations into infrared selective variable stars. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so this is the catchy title of my thesis, if you're masochistic enough to read it at some point. Uh, um, wherein I basically examine eruptive variability in YSOs uh, with spectroscopy and photometry, with a focus on the near infrared and mid infrared, as well as classifying novel non YSO variables that otherwise got in the way of all our data. Uh, joining collaboration with these lovely people listed here and many more. Oh, notions. So, one way of an overview, uh, we'll be going through uh, an introduction to eruptive variables in YSOs, as well as star formation, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. I'm sure most people in here have heard me, or Phil, or Jen, at some point rapid on about this stuff anyway, but we'll go through it one more time so everyone's all clued up. Uh, I'm then going to give you some background on the various surveys that I've kind of made use of during my uh, PhD, including UKIS UGPS, uh, VVV, although I don't know it as well as Niall does, uh, and Neowise for the mid-infrared style of things. And then I'm going to leap into a discussion on the results of my first chapter of my thesis, covering a spectral sample of, YS, of possible eruptive YSOs and some statistics associated with exactly what kind of variables we actually come up with, as well as a dive into my current work, which is eruptive variables found within mid-infrared surveys, uh, especially in the role of Cygnus X, uh, and looking at the role of embedded versus non-embedded younger and older systems and how they play into what eruptive variables we find. Uh, and I'm then going to pivot and talk about some of the other nonsense I did in my PhD, including infrared bright non-YSOs, uh, is a category variable, and then some AGB stuff if I have time. So a brief overview of YSOs, young stellar objects. Now, uh, helpfully named from classes zero to three. There are obviously five classes. Don't look at that math too hard. We start off with class zeros, which are objectively not optically or near infrared visible. Uh, they are full blown protostars. They're still collapsing in their initial cloud core. Uh, you start being actual stars, really, at class ones, where we see significant near infrared and mid infrared excess. Their SEDs peak at around about 100 microns, and that peak shifts as we go th through the classes. Uh, Beyond class one, we have what we call flat spectrum or class 1.5s, which we have a much better name. I don't know why we're going to use that, uh, which are su subtly between class one and class two, uh, as decided by their the shape of the SED slope uh, around about uh, that sort of region here. Flat spectrum, so named uh, because that bit there is flat. Then we move into class twos, which are your classical T Tari stars. We've seen images of with the various ones from D-sharp to get an idea of roughly what a class D YSO looks like. Got several disks, uh, inner accretion disk, and then your mid plane and outer disk areas of differing temperature. Uh, as, they, as they get colder, as they go further out. Uh, for eruptive variability, we're talking about stuff going on mostly in the inner disk and the way we see it into the mid disk. Now, class three YSOs, as we can see from the SEB here, they don't really have much near infrared excess. These are objectively main sequence stars now, but they have just a small amount of debris disk left that produces a tiny amount of infrared excess. Uh, I won't really be talking about them in any detail. Now, eruptive variability is crucial for understanding what we now call the protostellar luminosity spread problem, which is subtly different to the protostellar luminosity problem, which is mostly solved. That governed uh, us not understanding how we could make the required masses of YSOs in a given star forming region. Uh, with the timescales of accretion that we know of. Turns out we can actually have a broader spread on timescales to produce stars than we originally thought, so that's otherwise solved. 
but there is still a far greater spread in the observed luminosities of uh, YSOs to be explained by a standard mass-based sequence. That is the protostellar luminosity spread problem. If you want to look at it in more detail, uh, protostars and planet seven has a good section on it. Uh, give it a read. Eruptive variables traditionally would have been part of two groups, Fiors and Xors, named after F-U-R-E and E-X Lu. Uh, these days, the waters have been muddied considerably by more and more classes that are gradually getting more like a tangled web at this point. But uh, I will do my best to get some examples up for you with some mid infrared and near infrared light curves. Uh, at the top, we have a classical view. Uh, these ones here are from Jen Lakers paper, so formerly of this parish. And over here, we have a rather cool spicy target that someone in the room wrote and thought about. Uh, this is a traditional, well, traditionally it's XOR, and then in between we've got a couple of odd targets. This thing here with multiple different timescale events going on at once, we've got repeated outbursts and a longer term trend. These are tentatively called multiple timescale variables, but chances are that classification is going to change over the coming years as we try and work out what's actually going on. Uh, BDD V270, you'd think, looks a bit like a QOR, just with a maybe a slightly shorter overall duration. Uh, this one is actually more EXOR-like. Uh, these are long-duration XORs, uh, otherwise known as VVV721 or the 1647ORI-like objects. Uh, now, FIORs, as a general rule, have a, well, yeah, a short, sharp rise over the course of anything from months to a few years, and then a very long-duration, high accretion state at the top that can last an order of centuries, but lower limit is generally considered around 10 years. I mean, it's a tentative 10 year one, it's subject to change. Whereas XORs, they can last, they tend to be much more in amplitude, around about two mags, uh, about three, uh, and they last on the region for a few months to a year total. Some do seem to be going on to like two or three years now. Uh, they do occasionally repeat. Uh, they are, although a periodic at best, certainly there's nothing you could pinpoint and go, they happen repeatedly every X number of years because there's no physical reason why they need it. Now, as for actually drawing out and confirming them, we can't just use photometry. Generally speaking, we have to use spectroscopy as well. Uh, spectroscopically, XORs and other magnetospheric accretion dominated eruptive variables will have a spectrum a bit like this. Uh, some of the lines will change in their line ratios, of course. Uh, this is a K-band spectrum. They have also a J and H band. Uh, as well as optical ones, or if they're obviously visible. But mostly you're going to see signs of winds, uh, in this case, molecular hydrogen. Uh, accretion, in this case, bracket gamma, but any other hydrogen recombination lines will do. And some sort of emission from the mid plane of the disk, and in this case, it's 12 carbon monoxide. Now, below it, we also have some photospheric lines, uh, or things from the accretion column, which is where you frequently see the sodium doubling. Now, for the larger, longer term uh, eruptive events, or generally ones that have this sort of shape, these are led by gravitational instability, collapsing a disk, falling on the star, and crushing its magnetic field. So we no longer see any signs of magnetospheric accretion, even though we know the measured accretion rate is huge. Uh, you can actually put up to, uh, was it 10 to the minus four of a solar mass in, in one single pure event, which is a massive increase in the accretion rate. Where all these, the only kind of lines of note generally in a fuel, uh, as well as any other GI dominated eruptive variable, are these 12 CO absorption troughs, which is because we're seeing intense heating of the inner region that is then being re emitted by the beam in play of the disk, which is still fairly cool. Uh, oh, other things to note really, uh, you occasionally around here will see a P signal profile on your bracket gamma line and any other hydro recombination lines. Uh, because there can occasionally be a wind or an outflow coming from these objects. It's just quite hard to detect with such a thick envelope around the normally younger sources uh, that will do your fewer events. Traditionally, they've all been detected in an optical first, which is more a selection bias than it is a scientific reason for it. Uh, they were generally optical ones are easy to detect because the optical outburst by the time you've cleared these disks is substantial, meaning you can pick it up nicely in surveys like ZTF, or with gyre alerts, things like that. Here we kind of show a few, uh, this is another diagram of an MTB, one of Jen's previous works. And you can kind of see that you can pick a 
sort of period with Logan Scargill. Now he stopped twitching. Uh, but you can see a some sort of periodic event on term of a longer term trend. One could be accretion, one could be extinction simultaneously. These are complex systems with lots of components. So it's not unsurprising. And the more high cadence data that we get, the more of these we're going to come across. But as I said, yeah, we've got uh, BM nozzle, B1647 ori like sources, which are mixed characteristics. So if you look at the light curve, you'd think it was a fuel, but if you look at the spectrum, you'd think it's an XOR. Uh, these are getting to be more common uh, as we dig, dig out more of these objects. So we're now in kind of the process of trying to increase the sample size of these things. Uh, number of confirmed fuels until well, last time I gave this talk was 16. Now we're pushing 30 because uh, Jen put a paper out as well as a couple of others that are dropping onto the archive in the last few weeks. Uh, so whilst the number of fuels is going up, XOR's a bit higher as well, but we still want to get to a point where we can put way more of these down. Uh, and big time domain surveys and spectroscop spectroscopic surveys are the way to do that. Now, the majority of part of my uh, Thesis was done using UKIS UDBS because I have to work in the Northern Hemisphere, which is like the Southern Sky with VVV, only instead of having 70 epochs, I have two, well, three if you're lucky and you've got two mass. Uh, they cover the Northern and Equatorial regions of the Galactic Plain, uh, two epochs of near infrared imaging covering 1800 square degrees. Uh, we've got KS band at two epochs and then JNH band at one, so we can get some color information. Uh, and in the results, we've got a survey by Carlos Contreras in 2014 and Phil in 2017, produced a sample of uh, various high amplitude, by high amplitude greater than one mag variables uh, that are found within that survey. The 2014 one was just a pre release area, uh, covered serpents, and the all sky survey in 2017. And the key finding was that YSOs, or suspected YSOs, dominate the infrared variable sky, with a fraction of about 60% of all variables being YSOs. Now, I also use VVV for some stuff that will come up later on. Uh, and that covers the entire Southern Galactic Plane as a counterpart, but with more epochs. Uh, and it was in 2017, it was extended uh, quite literally in terms of the time baseline, so it carried on going, but also in terms of the coverage. Uh, the red parts here and the yellow were the original VVV survey. All the additional parts here are the extended regions. So we have another 12 or so epochs. Uh, that's not currently available, but the reduction is finished now, apparently. So hopefully that'll be incoming in the next, well, year. Although I was told that when I started my PhD, and everyone knows how long I've been here. <laughs> but no, it's faster than we've. <laughs> uh, now, the final one I use for my time domain stuff is the mid-infrared, uh, which I use for Neowise, as well as Untimely. Uh, Neowise uh, is the reactivation of the WISE satellite from uh, NASA IPAC, uh, which originally has four filters. Neowise only has two left because the cryogenic fuel basically ran out and it doesn't point properly. But it now covers the entire sky uh, around about three times a year. Uh, each of these kind of epochs has 10 to 20 individual scans, although best practice when using Neowise for any of you that are going to use it for anything, uh, don't trust the individual scans ever because the spread in the individual scans is far higher than the errors that they state on them, which I don't know about you, but it sounds a bit suspicious. So best practice is to take a median stack uh, for these and use those, which is what I'm doing. Uh, now for times when you don't have the depth you need, Neowise is safe throughout 14, 15 mag, but beyond that, it gets a bit sketch. Uh, but you can use Untimely, uh, which is the catalog version in a time domain of the unwise deep stack images. So taking the three epochs per year, squishing it into one single one, uh, and then probing deeper down to about 16, 17 with these. So the targets, which I didn't get good light curves for, I would run through untimely and get another one. So to get into the sample that formed chapter one of my thesis, uh, here and there are on a color magnitude diagram, H plus K versus J minus H, where we can see uh, some rough categorizations that I put forward uh, for them on a classical T-Power Relocus, and then a red name track. So, uh, sort of standard red ring when you're dealing with YSOs, you tend to put them in a diagram like this. Uh, we'll also note that one of these, not YSOs, the green circles here are things that I have reclassified from Phil's YSO classification into a symbiote classification, so an evolved object, uh, 
if Michael is also aware of the bane of these things, where you have a really hot white dwarf, you can move your SED uh, bluewood basically from an ATP star, which then puts you in the YSO region, making them quite hard to pick out unless you've got spectroscopy or time domain imaging. Now, these stars were selected uh, on the basis that they were fairly bright, K14.5 and above. Uh, this is basically just making sure you get good quality spectroscopy, and they're in nearby, well studied star forming regions with no distance. This basically means we've got plenty of other fullback data that we can build a more complete picture on. Uh, and these are done across three runs, two on Gemini, uh, which were reduced by Carlos during his sort of post PhD, but still around time. And then one lot by me on Subaru with IRCS. Of these, 14 are in Cygnus, three more in Serpens, three in Aquila, and 10 or others are just located in nearby IRDCs with names that are too boring to write down. Key points. Two new fjords, which is nice. We'll have to get a research note out on these in short order because I kept putting it off during my PhD because there was always other things to be doing. Uh, basically, uh, the spectra are already there. They look fjord-like. I, to this, added a search into two mass, which didn't have detections on either of them to work out what the minimum detection would have been to set limits on the amplitude, as well as collating the mid-infrared light curves see if they are behaving like post-outburst fuels. Good news, they are. Here are the spectra. That's the fuel like. Uh, unusual feature there, I think that is just a bit of correlated noise. It doesn't seem to line up with any known lines that I could come up with. Uh, the main takeaway was that Source 500 now has a minimum amplitude of four mag in near infrared and a duration uh, for the rise of at least 4,000 days. It could also be a lot shorter than that. Uh, this is just the time sampling we've got between the last UGPS K image and the first two mass one. So it could be shorter, it could be longer, we don't know. Here is the light curve. Uh, this one there being our lower limit. Sorry, it's not an arrow on it. I made this about 10 minutes before I talk. Uh, but this being the K based rise and then the mid infrared post outburst. Cool. Uh, the other one has an untimely light curve, which I realize I've got a load of the thesis. Sorry. XORs. Now, they were seven of these, although five of them we suspect are quiescent, because at the time of the spectrum being taken, which is normally about three or four years after the detected rise, uh, there wasn't too much sign of an eruption going on, but the magnetospheric accretion rate was still sky high. Uh, generally speaking, graphic gamma equivalent widths of greater than eight angstrom, or minus eight angstrom, uh, are taken to be a sign of unusually high magnetospheric accretion rate. Uh, these went from anything from 8.1, in the lowest case, up to 22 angstrom. So these are still clearly coming down from some kind of eruption, so it tends to be saying that five of them are quiescent exhaust. The other two, source 463 and 533, uh, one of which, 533, has a obvious exor-like spectrum, and it also has a fairly variable light curve in the mid-infrared, although what's odd is that the eruption doesn't seem to have stopped in order for it to make sense, uh, as the very much clear uh, outflow that we're seeing, as well as the emission lines, indicate that it is an XOR-like star, so we presume it's a long period XOR. The other, source 463, didn't have much going on in the near-wise light curves until I came to point out my thesis, when a new outburst was detected in the updated near-wise light curves I was making for completeness sake. Uh, with another one mag outburst that lasts about a year and a bit. Here are some of those things I mentioned. There's the spectrum for 533. These are two spectra for source 463. We've got one uh, 2015 in Cyan, which is uh, basically directly after the first eruption, and then a later one where it's settled down and the accretion rate is starting to build up once again, and the wind contribution has fallen. Here is the long period light curve for, for source 533. And source 463s is found. Oh, it's just a double taste uh, in there. See that point there? Going on there. About mag in there. I see on Zoom. Oh, you can see on Zoom. Great news. So that's the middle one for those on Zoom. Now, that wasn't too many eruptive wires those we found. Uh, the non eruptive ones. 13 have YSO-like spectra. Of their six class ones, 
four flat spectrum and three of class twos. There are also three dippers, uh, which are all class twos as well. Uh, these are stars with variable extinction levels, two of which are incredibly long duration, and one is short term like AA tau, which was seen as untimely. Uh, four of the other likely YSOs are no longer likely YSOs, as far as we're concerned, more likely symbiotes, because their spectrum contains a whole mix of different features. You see CO in absorption, uh, and including some 13 CO, which we'll see in the next slide, but lots of other lines in emission, especially accretion ones, which is roughly similar to what you'd expect from an evolved star spewing circumstellar matter on top of a half white dwarf. So these are dusty D type symbiotes as opposed to regular D type symbiotes, which don't have quite the same level. This is different between an AGB companion and a red giant companion. The only other thing to mention is that one of the class one YSOs. Uh, which again, I forgot to keep the light up, sorry. Uh, but it had a three mag outburst seen only in untimely. Uh, that happened just after the spectrum was taken. Uh, I would suspect within about six months of the spectrum being taken, giant three mag outburst that then lasted two years. Uh, here are the dippers on their light curves. So you're seeing quite substantial amplitude changes. Uh, each one is now starting its sort of return cycle over the course. You can actually, when I started my PhD, it was here. And when I finished, we're over there. You can track it every year. And here are the spectra of two of the symbiotes. Again, you can see the 13 carbon. Uh, they are marked on the box for you. And they can be clearly seen in this second batch here. These are the more kind of concrete. We definitely think these two are D types. These ones are not quite so sure. Then we did some stats to work out how many we can expect. Now, because it is low number of statistics, we only had 30 things to work with. Uh, we had to get a bit creative. But to test this, because we already had a, uh, from previous kind of ways of checking completeness, around about a 10% eruptive variable fraction and a 20% UGPS completeness to work from. Uh, instead, what I did was I took a binomial approach wherein a star could be eruptive or not. And I tested the various different fractions of eruptive variables from our sample of 390 YSOs that we could have picked from. And then we basically trialed 30 from this selection each time uh, in a Bayesian fashion. Uh, basically this over here is the equation that we used as our likelihood. And then we compute our expectation percentage number of YSOs that we'd expect to find depending on uh, R. Now R here is our observed number of YSO found from our sample of 30 spectra, depending on how confident we are. Uh, two, taken for just a few wars. They're clear, they're obvious, they're real. Three, with, when we include source 533, the obvious looking XOR. And then nine, when we include the quiescent XORs as well. Uh, and these are the results that we come across that are in the thesis if you're that way inclined to read them. Uh, here are the plots. Uh, you can sort of see there's a bit rushed because I made that earlier. But you can see that it was to get slightly less certain as we including more and more of the uncertain uh, XORs. We are just less confident on these because we're assuming the high accretion rate must be post outburst, but we have no confirmation of that. So then time was ahead for expanding the completeness of that survey, because if we want to get close to what we see with VVV, which has about 80% completeness, we either have to add more epochs, which we can't do when something's happened in the past, or we have to try and probe deeper. Now, the handy thing that I came up with for this was that because Phil had set two epochs that needed to be observed as a chain, so from 16 to 15 being the lowest kind of lowest brightness outburst that could exist within his final sample, instead I say uh, a non-detection and then a 16 is also appropriate, and I will manually check them. Now, obviously, that for an entire sky is completely incomprehensible without machine learning. And because now I haven't started, but I came up with this idea, that option was away from me. And thus, instead, I decided to take a known star forming region and leverage the fact that UGPS covered a lot of nearby star forming regions. I chose Cygnus X uh, because there was a good sample of YSOs uh, from the Cygnus X legacy survey by Spitzer. Uh, and from here, it's also now spicy. And I, in hindsight, I would have redone it using spicy catalog if I did this recently as opposed to two years ago. But in so doing, 
there were 216 stars uh, that basically fit this new expanded criterion. And, and of those, 15 of them appear to be genuine variable YSOs with at least one mag variability. So then I performed the same near y related tests on these to see which ones were actually interesting. And of those, five were of interest. Uh, three of them even had nebulosity associated with some sort of outburst. Now we can see one of them here. This is source 1017. You have to apologize, well, I apologize for the plots. Uh, they have been redone, but they're for a new paper that's coming out and they're not quite ready yet. But the actual data doesn't change. Uh, we've got a very, very short period, uh, short duration outburst on this star. Uh, it's done in about seven years, which puts it in an intermediate time scale category uh, and makes it a good target for getting some spectroscopy on. Uh, downside is it's gotten quite faint. Uh, its current uh, K band magnitude we had done on a DDT uh, telescope proposal or telescope data that we got a few months ago, uh, and it's floating around about mag 16 in K now. Uh, here are those K-band images that I picked out. Nebulosity in one, and the star's gone in the other. So, a good sign that there was an outburst. Uh, this image here is round about there on the diagram. As you can see, it's just off the scale at the bottom. And the one with nebulosity is nearer the peak. Now, if I wanted to expand this to a greater sample area, because this is a, a five interesting variables hit rate isn't brilliant, and I wanted more. So instead, I thought to go and look at the entire Kuro 2014 sample from the Super Legacy Survey, uh, and basically identify any and all eruptive variables that I could find in it. Uh, they start with 2007 of them, uh, i.e. Uh, near-wise data that was of good quality for 1,332 of those, uh, and they basically were all inspected to see what was going on. Uh, from these, uh, there are 35 eruptive variable candidates that we came across. We found seven uh, what we're going to call long-term eruptive candidates. Uh, until recently, we called them fuel candidates. We've now changed how this paper is working to go in line with what our, so our group is doing, which is breaking up like curves, not by morphology, but by duration. But a lot of these have fewer looking uh, light curves, but of various durations. Some are shorter than others. The short term ones, or intermediate term ones, I should say, of course, 1017, 812, uh, and uh, 1999. I'll show you some of these light curves on the comment pages. Uh, 1017, you already looked at. Source 812 uh, is here. This is the untimely light curve. Yeah, it's not actually visible in nearwise. You only have basically this one, that one, and those, whereas you've got the entire light curve in that timing. What's interesting about source 812 is the rise time. This is around about three and a bit months, which is very fast for one of for few wars generally, and certainly very fast for a mid infrared detected one where the rest of ours seem to take about two years to reach their peak. It also has a kind of long buildup, which we start to see now with uh, mid infrared observations of fjords as we're finding more of them, uh, that is theorized to be the result of a buildup of material hovering outside the inner disk before it collapses in a kind of GI outdriven outburst. Uh, similar in shape to PGIR 20 DCI, if you're interested in reading that. Source 257 has a predicted duration of 22 years, which is still on the short side for a fuel, uh, but this is. Uh, fitted using a technique I will show you in the slide. And then have source 1475, which is why we were calling these fuel candidates, because this one has had a spectrum taken of it by Carlos. It's been published in a research note uh, in the Korea National Oracle Journal. Uh, this is one of those times when we forget for one week we forgot to talk about what research we were doing together, and we accidentally came up with the same target twice. But source 1475 has an obvious fuel spectrum. So that leads us to hope that the others will do too. Uh, telescope data hopefully incoming soon. We also have found a bunch of new XORs uh, or XOR candidates. Quite a lot of these are repeating, which is unusual. Uh, stats uh, coming out of the pipe for the new paper on that. But six of these are repeating outbursts, the other nine single outbursts. The largest one of the lot is source 1626. Which I should 
There we go. Which is usually around about three mag. But still two year duration, which is roughly what you'd expect from an XOR. And, but none of these outbursts are periodic as well, I should say. Now, the biggest thing that I found from this group that was really interesting to me the most is that we had a population of longer rising items where the one year to a few months time period seems to be extended from between three to 10. Uh, normally of a slightly lower amplitude as well. So essentially mags per year is lower. And now there's 11 of these. Tentatively, I think when we publish the paper, we're going to probably drop that down to about eight that we're confident with. Uh, but we can see here, source 1884 and 1991 show it quite clearly. And we're seeing these long duration rises, uh, which haven't really been encountered before. We occasionally see something a bit like this before a giant fuel outburst. So it remains to be seen if this is a precursor to something like that, or if we're seeing a gradually enhancing accretion rate that looks like an eruption in terms of amplitude, but not in terms of morphology. Uh, so is there more than one way to do it? Uh, fingers crossed again, telescope uh, spectroscopic data will tell us more. Now, there's two I want to draw direct attention to. Source 1048 was one of those original five that I found within the UTPS data. As uh, we also should point out, ignore these one points, they are dodgy as hell. The actual uh, eruption itself appears, at least, to be around about four max, uh, with a 10 year approximate duration on the rise. Not entirely sure what's caused it, and there is no optical data for it. No gyro alert, no ZTS on the force photography. None of these do, with the exception of uh, source 1475, which has a brief blip in ZTS before it disappears again. Now, the reddening tracks as it should do, where the longer the outburst goes on, the bluer it gets, which is what we kind of want to see with viewers. Uh, and the same is true for source 2003, which is my personal favorite from the group, because it's not done outbursting yet and it's already five max. If the next uh, Neowise epoch can confirm it, uh, and it's going up even further, it will be, I think, the second largest amplitude detected in a YSO ever. So hopefully we'll get scooped in that time. I want to get this one out pretty prompt. But as yet, we also can't tell if this is going to be a few like outburst or an XOR like outburst because it hasn't stopped yet. Uh, and I'd ideally like about two or three epochs of post outburst or post peak outburst to then fit a decay slope to it. Now, uh, as a good comparison point for this sample, because the, the Spitzer selective group were also selected on purpose to be class one YSOs with a 24 micron detection in MIPS. I kind of wanted to go, well, let's see if we can probe a younger group of stars in the same field to see how they compare. Now, there's an excellent catalog for that called Spicy that hopefully will do the job of basically uh, providing that counterpart in age to see if there's any changes. Now, the majority of things we found within Spicy, we started with uh, 7,000 sources or so down to about, uh, I think it was around about 2,000 or so that we actually had good data for. And from then we had 70 uh, eruptive candidate sources. So less by comparison to the number we were actually checking than we got from the previous sample of class ones, which was interesting in and of itself. Uh, but almost all of these came through as short duration XOR-like events. Here are some of the examples, uh, including my personal favorite, with one with a Fairly substantial 2.5 mag outburst, followed by lots of other ones afterwards. Oh, uh, 4,000, uh, 5,000 of which had good light curves that I checked, and then 400 have more than one mag variability. There are four that have a fairly long term uh, outburst. Uh, this being the only one I find we're actually confident with, which appears to be a long duration XOR. Now, to do a proper comparison between the two samples, uh, you see here we've got two histograms. The lower one are our embedded sources from the Kriakova sample with mixed detections. And we can clearly see that we've got a much longer tail for high amplitudes, as well as generally favoring amplitudes around about a mag, which we just don't have with the younger source, or the older sources, so the class twos. 
Uh, we did a KDE, a uh, Gaussian KDE on this uh, to basically fit a likelihood to a histogram. We then randomly sampled from that a million times each uh, and ran a man with the U test on it to make sure that they were drawn from different samples so they could actually have some degree of statistical significance to something. Uh, all was well. Uh, they are from different samples, most likely. Good news. So you have a look in the actual stars more directly. We can see that viewers will generally display a aside. Viewers normally will have higher amplitudes, the bluer their colors when quiescent. There's simply less material there to block the light coming through to you, and thus you'll see a much brighter outburst. Our embedded sources, that isn't seemingly true. The blue sources on this plot are the classical near infrared selected ones. Uh, it's just a sample of viewers and literature. And, and then our cyan and red points are our fast and slow rising uh, long and intermediate term outbursts, effectively. And we can see that they have a quite different, now it's a tentative one, but very the trend is not either, either is either there. Either the trend has gone or the trend is actually inverted. Uh, hopefully, we'll find some more and actually test that out. Most uh, a reason that this could be is from re emission from the mid plane of the disk for these mid infrared sources, which have thicker envelopes. We're just simply seeing more of the internal light re emitted back down in the mid infrared, so they appear even brighter uh, and more red when they are. Dead. And then we're starting for the final part of our paper to have a look at a few more factors to see. Or comparison we can find. Uh, so we'll be comparing outburst duration, outburst rise times, and the SED slope versus overall time scales. Here are some of the work in progress plots we've got going on. On this on the plot on the left, we have W1 amplitude versus the outburst rising time scale for our standard outbursts and our slower outbursts. Generally speaking, we have higher amplitudes for the more fuel-like sources. And for our long-term ones, the amplitude tend to be lower. Uh, the only odd one is source 1048, which is this high point up here. We've also started, uh, we, I have also started getting the durations mapped out for the sources that we've got a few post-peak uh, points in the near-wide light curve for, just for the standard linear decay that runs until the quiescent magnitude, predicting rough durations. We've got uh, source 812 here from earlier. And then we also have source 199, which has quite a high large amplitude outburst, but it's still only a six year time frame, which is un it's just unlike ones we found before, really. Uh, you'd expect for an amplitude that high, quite a long you know, 20, 30 years, not six. So hoping to get uh, some spectroscopy on this quickly more updates. Future work on this subject is going to cover uh, doing, well, hopefully a few bit more photography. We've got successful DDT time, but only half of them got done. So hopefully we'll get the others when they become visible again uh, in near well, in Spain. To get JH and K contemporaneous data. So we have a rough idea of the outburst amplitude in the near infrared rather than the mid infrared to see how it compares to traditional near infrared selected sources. And then subject to time allocation. Hopefully someone somewhere will give me some telescope data this cycle so we can get uh, some near infrared spectroscopy done on as many of these as we can. Other things we want to do is refine our view or fitting algorithm that I was working on with Niall. Niall did the majority of the work here. Go to Niall's GitHub at Tare. It's awesome for all your fitting needs. Uh, but there's a separate section on there for doing view ors, which we worked on together. Uh, and the idea is you might have to try and run this on Neowise directly to just start drawing out view ors from their light curve morphology as opposed to their amplitudes. And then final plan is to utilize ZVB uh, and its southern hemisphere uh, in concert with existing MIPSGAL and GLIMPS 360 data to reproduce our embedded versus non embedded sample that I will have to be working on with Mike uh, in the southern hemisphere, mostly because we've also got. Uh, other Southern Hemisphere surveys coming online now that we can help you join together, things like DESI, uh, might be able to get us optical spectroscopy if any of these stars turn out to be optically visible. That's future stuff in that, uh, but now we will move on to 
some of the other random stuff that I found in my thesis. Uh, that's no YSO. You can excuse my, I did this in like two minutes because meme templates. Source 463, 363. Uh, those of you that have been here for a while will know what this is. Uh, we found a new infrared bright cataclysmic variable uh, hiding around in YSO data simply because its variability is fast enough that we can catch it on the filter wheel timescale changes on UCURT. The filter wheel uh, change was seen and briefly mentioned in Phil's paper. Uh, it was my job to work out what it was because we were interested and in why do YSOs when you can do this. Uh, given the time scale of 15 minutes and the blue colors and the HR for excess in IFAS, we'd assume some sort of compact object. Dive distance of 900 parsecs pretty much means this is unlikely to be a neutron star. So we're looking at some sort of white dwarf binary. Now, white dwarf binaries with period, well, periods, but uh, variability that fast, not likely to be a dwarf nova, much more likely to be a variable. Uh, they come in a few different flavors, uh, symbiotes in one side, which uh, have evolved donor stars, and unevolved donor stars, which are polars and intermediate polars. The name is strange. Don't know why that. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, spectra, intermediate polars have broader lines, a bit more noise, and you'll see that they have similar uh, sort of line heights and fluxes for H alpha and H beta, and reduced, well, quite an enhanced helium fluxes compared to a polar, which has reduced helium, and gradually, you know, it favors higher energy states and hydrogen recombination lines. So H gamma is brighter than H beta, which is brighter than H alpha. The differentiation between these two sources is that IPs have an accretion disk, whereas polars do not. They accrete directly from their uh, donut star, basically, with IPs accreting an accretion disk that is filled from its donut star. Now, for IPs, there's something called a period gap. Uh, said period gap is the term given to the absence of intermediate polars with periods between 2.1 and 3 hours. Uh, but what this gives for us is a cutoff in the observed orbital period for our star because we couldn't uh, observe one with all the data we got from uh, basically the test of the camera on Weave, which is PFQHY, uh, which they're using for like, sort of startup imaging on it. Uh, we got to test it. Uh, and Niall came up with a period finding algorithm that predicted 63 minutes. Referee didn't like it. We got annoyed. Uh, and thus, we asked for more time to get more photometry on it. Hope, hoping to basically detect an orbital period so we can work out which side of the period gap our star lives on. Here is some data we got on it, just in the spectrum on SOAR. Line ratio, the only interesting thing to note really that differentiates from a normal IP is that we see a much larger line flux from H alpha than we do from H beta and then H gamma. This is commensurate with a dwarf nova. So what we've assumed, uh, that's what we've assumed, uh, Janet Drew helpfully pointed us towards, is that this might be a system with a much more complete accretion disk. So we see uh, the telltale signs of a thicker accretion disk in our spectrum. Here is a five hour light curve taken on Liverpool telescope, which I applied for out of spite for a referee because I was sure Miles' period by algorithm was correct. It was, uh, as we can see here, a phase fold on a 63 minute period over five cycles gives us something that is reasonably confident. Now, you might go, that's a large amount of spread there. I don't trust this. Uh, Catalytic variables have a problem called flickering, which basically means they have a periodic variation on fairly short timescales, which means that you normally want about 12 cycles to really commit to a period. We've got about five, but it's already looking good. Especially on the kind of the lower points of the beta states of the system, which seem to map over quite nice, which is about what we want, because at that point, you're being dominated by disk emission, not star emission. The disk will be less affected by flickering. And see how it fits into the IP population since I'm running low on time. Uh, here is basically all the known IPs that exist and are confirmed. This little group up here, what we call short period IPs, short period for, uh, well, actually, neither of the two things really. Uh, they basically have a different spin orbit ratio, which is what they should be called, uh, of 0 0.5. So the orbital period is twice that of the spin period. A polar for reference is one to one. So they live up here, and generally nothing exists in this gap. Uh, but they side note, no, I'm not convinced that's true, and are working on plans to look at that as well, provided somebody somewhere gives me a job. Uh, other things to note, there's the SED. Again, unusual compared to existing sources. It's optically faint, most likely because of a more complete accretion disk. 
The question remains, therefore, can we find more? Because it isn't unusual because of its you know, a strange circumstances, unusual because we found it in a different wavelength band. So by moving over to VVV, can we find more? I tried with Virac uh, and the various tools that Virac has at its disposal. Wasn't great return. There's a three candidates up here that I inspected and wasn't particularly trustworthy of, but we're going to expand that to using Primus, Miller et al. in prep, uh, because there's already things that look similar in there because I've seen them on his computer screen. So we're going to go and draw them out using cool new techniques, hopefully find a big sample that we can cross-reference with VFAS, e Rosita, and Desi to hopefully get a nice good sample of these infrared bright IPs in the coming years. And because I'm running low on time, I'll briefly mention that the final chapter of my thesis governed some AGB stars that look like YSOs, but aren't. They were projected across a YSO star forming region, and that made their colors be a bit strange. And because these are pulsating AGB stars, their spectra also changes uh, uh, from emission dominated to absorption dominated over time. If you map out when we got spectra versus their near wise light curves, the ones that have emission features are at their bright state, and the ones that don't are at their faint state. There were three of these in the sample. Uh, and all I did was basically work out that they were, in fact, AGB stars, not YSOs, by mapping their uh, kinematics to prove that they don't work with any population in the Milky Way disk, either the mature or the young thin disk. Uh, with that in mind, uh, the only way they could exist was in the galactic halo, which then means we could use a flux-based distance for an AGB star, if we already are pretty sure these are AGB stars anyway, because their spectra says so, and their light curves are not YSO-like. Uh, that is our fitting of the various different distances it can be at, and none of that worked, the spectra. Uh, some iron lines and some 13CO, again, you don't see those in YSOs, so it did seem more likely that these are AGB stars. And uh, when I use flux-based distances, they then fit quite nicely on a period luminosity diagram for AGB stars. Uh, there is, this extended line here covers OHIR stars, uh, which can give you that pulsating behavior. If you have an OHIR mimic, you won't have a maser. So that became our best guess for what these stars might be. Uh, and that was the end of my thesis. So I'll leave you with concluding remarks. We confirmed two subjective fuels and identified seven candidate XORs from 30 spectrally observed YSOs from Phil's 2017 sample of eruptive variables in the Northern Hemisphere. We pushed GPS data to try and find more, identifying 15 more within Cygnus X. And then by expanding that further, we located up to 70 new eruptive variable candidates in Cygnus X alone. The infrared variable sky contains tons of new populations of stars that we want to investigate. Uh, have a look at Phil and Jen's data paper for things like uh, high amplitude giant stars. We've got symbiotes, we've got category variables. There's more stuff there. Check out Primus when it comes out. There's going to be even more in that. And you can distinguish AGB stars from YSOs if you try hard enough. Uh, and apologies, this is a previous version of my talk, and the references are missing. So that's, that's me. That's done. Thank you very much, Helen. Any questions? Or oh, no, Mike. So I was wondering about uh, whether you see spectra where you get basically featureless spectra, like this one uh, paper or object that Phil had written to regard. Did mm. you get any more of these? Yes, yeah. Uh, the spectra for the kind of YSOs that didn't have eruptive tendencies, they were all basically featureless. There was about seven, I think, that had entirely featureless spectra with nothing in them at all. Hence why I didn't include them in the talk because they're a bit dull to look at. Do you want to see some squiggly lines? No. But yes, there are a few features of spectra in those YSOs as well that would soon be doing nothing. But, but they are eruptive. Uh, well, they were they had high amplitude variability, yeah. but without any way to trace that eruption, we can't really be sure because the annoying gap between all Ys and near Ys is commensurate with UGPS data. So we just don't have enough time baseline coverage to confirm it one way or the other. Likely, it could be more like that, yeah. yeah. And what, what fraction from? Uh, well, that those ones constituted about half of the non-eruptive YSOs in the sample, so we would increase that to say about twenty-five percent, then roughly. Yeah. 
Uh, they yes, some of them do show a yeah. So they have they have they can have an additional time scale variability in them. I don't have any of my data simply because uh, Neowise and the time sampling to really pick those out. Uh, VVV does have the ability to do that, uh, but they don't. They seem to be much lower amplitude in their original long term outburst as compared to the others. Yeah, <laughs> what I was about to ask is: in Structure variability. Oh, cool. Sometimes the time series can be as low as millisecond, but there are also short time periodic variability happens. So it is safe to do this. Mm. So it's just good to ask if you can research. Oh, like, oh. Structure here. No, I haven't found anything like that. Okay, no. Yeah. But it, it, it'd be too hard to do near wise, but it'd be interesting now, to see because. Is that structured variability because of changes in the X-ray binary secretion disk? Yeah, some viscosity time scales. Hmm. And I don't really know. I don't think there is a full explanation. Yeah. I mean, I think another way to, I mean, there were some other things that I didn't cover in the talk that we did work on, which were BE stars. And BEs are a good host for XRBs because you've got a stream of material that kind of will flow off from a B-type main sequence star onto their uh, X-ray binary companion basically and cause it to light up. Uh, and they, we did go and observe some, but the data was a bit naff, so we haven't really included it further. But those ones could well have contained uh, X-ray companions. We just didn't check. Um, just from a, it's obviously not my area, um, but I found all the experiments. How did the novel sources find the results? Uh, yeah. uh, so for YSOs, generally, uh, you assume a roughly 10% eruptive fraction for uh, already known variable YSOs, uh, which we sort of yielded from our near-infrared sample, between 8 and 13% for the ones that we're confident with. As we push that to sources that could well be eruptive, but it's just harder to confirm, we seem to go a bit above that towards 20%. So we expect we find a few more than we'd expect, but the big takeaway from what worked as the second chapter of my thesis was that as we push towards younger and younger systems, we're finding more and more eruptive events, uh, which was not it's not really been noted and written down before, but it was theorized, uh, it's mentioned briefly in a review in 2014, that they would expect to see more of these outbursts for class one systems because your a younger point in a south wing region it's more chaotic, you're going to have more ways to impact a less bound envelope and outer disk that can then cause kind of leading effects that will then lead to eruptions. Uh, and that is kind of what we're seeing, which is good. It kind of helps bear that out, which is one of the concluding points of my new paper. Uh, I'm going to put a little into how many you might miss because of saturation slash completion. Uh, completion wise from uh, from UDPS, uh, it's generally assumed to be 20% completeness. Uh, we did the test on uh, VUV and it's basically making an eruption uh, and then sampling a given number of times over it to see if you actually detected it. And you get 80% with VVV uh, and UDPS is considered to be five times less complete than VVV is. And thus you get 20% from that. Uh, so I had a look into the uh, increase in completeness from going below the detection thresholds yeah. uh, and well forgetting it's too hard to get real statistics out of it from doing one star forming region because I'm already picking known YSOs anyway as opposed to ones that might not be but already kind of biasing the samples I wanted to actually look for things but we got 15 out of 216 there the saturation stuff that is a question for Phil Phil likes to work on desaturating stuff would you curious to know how many of them how worse themselves out of potential yes that is it, it, yeah Worth looking into, actually. I mean, technically speaking, they would have come up in my original sample, uh, and I didn't come across any because I said non-detection, not lower limit. So we did get some that were saturated, but the problem is the majority of the saturation in these images isn't the actual YSO becoming oversaturated with an outburst. It's normally an oversaturated AGB star nearby that just ruins the frame, which makes it a little bit harder to tell. But realistically, there should be some, yeah. But I imagine you'd have to, in Northern Hemisphere, you'd probably looking for that in more nearby regions, like Taurus or Skosen. But 
I would assume that if there's stuff there that would be found and studied by somebody else, because it would be visible in the optical at that point rather than near as red. Okay, and let's thank our speaker again.